Okay, so I think you can see, can you see my PowerPoint well? Okay, yes. Okay, so we're going to start, uh, I mean, continue our discussion this afternoon. And yesterday, our last few topics was about the pressure ulcer. Okay, now, before we discuss and continue our lecture this afternoon, I might ask someone else to recall how does pressure ulcer develops? What is the physiology of pressure ulcer? What is the cause? Why it develops, okay? Can someone from this class open their audio and share to me what normally happens? Why a person develops pressure ulcer? And I'm going to ask voice first, okay? I'm going to ask um, Yusof. Yusof, can you open your audio? Uh, yes, doctor. Okay, yesterday we started discussing the pressure ulcer, correct? Yeah. And we also discussed the physiology of pressure ulcer. Physiology means how does it develop? Sa? Yes, yes. Okay, can you give me, uh, um, can, can you tell us, uh, can you tell to the group uh, if you have, if you can still recall, how does pressure ulcer develops? Uh, when the patient is confined to the bed for long periods of time, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he cannot move, or he is uh, uh, was put on a side for a long time, he can mm -hmm. develop blood sores or pressure ulcers. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the skin of that side where he is uh, touching the bed or the surface he is on has not mm -hmm. been moved. So uh, uh, lots of pressure is uh, applied on the skin and the tissue of that side. So what happens in the pressure area? What normally happens in the pressure e pressure points area? Why pressure also develops on those area? Uh, the weight of the body is pushing on the on that tissue or that skin. Mm -hmm. and, so what? Uh, the, so what? The, okay. the blood supply is decreased. Uh -huh. and the and nutrients are also decreased and thus the pressure uh, also develops okay very good yusuf okay it was a good explanation he says pressure ulcer develops most commonly on pressure points where do you see those pressure points those are in areas of the body over the bony prominences and prolonged immobility okay such as those patients who are unconscious those patients who cannot move those patients who are paralyzed the amount of blood supply and oxygen to those pressure points are reduced also the nutrients are reduced because of the reduction of blood oxygen and nutrients to the tissue okay and to the blood vessels what will happen it will damage and the resulting condition is cause pressure ulcer. Thank you so much, Yusuf. Okay, we also discuss several risk factors. When we see risk factors, these are conditions that could contribute for the development of pressure ulcer. On the slide right now are the different risk factors for the development of pressure ulcer. Now, I'm going to call three students they can choose in the risk factors on the slide and they can share to us um, how such risk factor contributes to pressure ulcer. Okay. I'm going to call... Um, uh, okay. Who among you wants to answer? You can open your audio and then you can answer the question. Introduce yourself first when you open your audio. Yes, Victor. Mm -hmm. Your name? Diana. Okay, Diana, you can choose the risk factor for pressure ulcer and you can share to us what is your understanding about that risk factor and how does it contribute to pressure ulcer? Yes. Uh, for example, the mental status. Mm -hmm. 
the patient who doesn't uh, have the uh, ability to to uh, to feel pain mm -hmm. so they uh, they doesn't move and um, change their uh, position so the uh, the ulcers will develop Very and, also, uh, and okay. also the patient of for example as the heimer they forget to to move and they change their position yes okay. Thank you so much. Very good. Okay. There are patients who do not have the ability to move, to change the position. And that immobility and inability to move position will contribute to the development of pressure ulcer. Very good. Now, I want an answer from a boy, from our male student. Again, open your audio and introduce yourself and you may share your answer. Do I have boys here? Yeah. Your name? Nahiyan. Okay, Nahiyan. You can choose the risk factor. Uh, fecal and urinary, uh, urinary incontinence. Okay. Um, when uh, the patient is unconscious and the urine... Uh, uh, contact with the skin for a long time, mm -hmm. the skin becomes uh, soft and uh, wrinkled. Okay, very good. Okay, Nahian says, thank you, Nahian. Nahian says, fecal and urinary incontinence. If a person is incontinent, if a person cannot control bowel elimination, the patient cannot control urinary elimination, the skin of your patient will be in contact with the urine, with the feces for a long period of time. And the interaction between the urine and fecal materials with the skin causes the skin to soften, causes the skin to be macerated. And if it is macerated, if it is soft, it is easily eroded. It easily gets an ulcer or wound. Very good. Okay, one last student. I prefer a female student. You can open your audio. You can sh you can uh, tell me your name and then you can answer. Yes, doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, Aisha. I am Aisha from Karshi. Okay, Aisha. Uh, inadequate nutrition. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, if the patient uh, doesn't have uh, enough protein, uh, okay. that uh, increase the uh, pressure of uh, the bone, so uh, that uh, increase the risk. Okay, what is the role of protein in our body, by the way? Uh, build the muscles. Okay, very good. Thank you, Aisha. Aisha says inadequate nutrition, specifically protein, which is very, very important, okay, for muscular growth and repair. Okay, so remember, if you have a pressure ulcer, okay, and the muscles are involved, it would be very difficult to recover, to heal if the patient has um, nutritional um, deficiency. Okay, thank you so much. It seems that you have listened to my discussion a few days ago. So at this point, I'm going to continue my discussion. We are still in pressure ulcer because this is one of the most important topic and a condition that is common among patients in the hospital. And I'm going to start, what are the different stages of pressure ulcer? But before I discuss to you and show you what are the different stages of pressure ulcer, let us first have a look at a normal skin structure, okay? By looking at the slide right now, you will see a normal skin structure, okay? And as you have recalled in your anatomy and physiology, your skin is composed of several layers, correct? The topmost layer of your skin is called epidermis. Just below the epidermis are dermis. Okay, below the dermis are your fats. We call them as adipose tissue. And of course, just below the adipose tissues are muscles and bones. These are the normal structure. Why I am showing this picture to you in relation to the stages of pressure ulcer? Because later on, you will understand that the stages of the pressure ulcer 
are determined according to the structure of the skin involved. That's why you need to know this one. Okay, let us first let us first describe the first stage of pressure ulcer formation. This is the initial phase. This is the initial stage. And at this stage, nurses should be alerted. Okay, nurses should be alerted because once stage one occur, normally the next few stages easily occur. Now, as nurses, you need to know how to identify the stage of pressure ulcer. Because by understanding the stage of the pressure ulcer, you will know how to manage the patient. Okay. Now, in the photo right now, you will see the layers of the skin. And normally, what happens to the dermis and epidermis? It is only reddish. There is a redness. Correct? You will see also in the photo below, I think this is the buttocks of the baby. See? The buttocks of the baby in the sacral area. This is a sacral area. Do you see the, uh, the, the, uh, the blue arrow? This points to the sacral area. And you know that sacral area is a pressure points. Okay. Now, you will see just a redness. When you see a redness, you might probably say that the pressure ulcer is in stage 1. Now, look at the definition of stage 1. Non-blanchable erythema signaling potential ulceration. So how do you know if the pressure ulcer is in stage 1? Okay, now, I want you to, to do it by yourself. That's what, like, what I am doing. Now, okay, I want you to have your hands, okay, like this, and use your one finger, okay? Now, I want you just follow what I'm doing, class, so that you will appreciate what do we mean by non-blanchable erythema. Now, with your thumb, with your finger, okay, maybe you can use your palm, okay? With one finger, try to apply pressure to your palm, like this. And then observe, what do, what do you see on the pressure points? See? Okay, I will call one student. Um, do we have Zainab here? Can you open your audio? Yes, Mr. Okay, can you try it in your palm? With the use of your one finger, just like, yes. just like what I'm doing now in the video, apply pressure using your one finger and try to observe the color. Yes, I'm seeing. Okay, what can you observe with your palm? Uh, first, it become white because we press uh, the area. Then after the blood, mm -hmm. yeah, after nearly three seconds, it become normal. What, what's the color after three seconds? Uh, sorry? What happened to the color after three seconds? It become kind of reddish. Okay, very good. Okay, now, you have understand already. Normally, when we press some parts of our body, you would see a white area. We call it as blanching. Okay, and after a few seconds, normally, after it appears white, after a few seconds, it will become red or pink again. That means the circulation is okay. That is for normal patients. However, for stage 1 pressure ulcer, when you apply pressure to the part, for example, to the sacral area, it will not turn to white. It will remain red. It will remain pinkish, which means there is non-blanchable erythema. That will give you an idea that the patient has a stage 1 pressure ulcer. Did you understand my point? Did you understand what is stage one pressure ulcer? Can you say yes or no in the in 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 the in, in the chat box? Did you understand stage one now? Very good, very good. Because when you go to the hospital, if you have an immobile patient, if you have a patient who is unconscious, you need to check the back. You need to check the back, and when you do back massage, 
try to apply pressure with your fingers and try to observe for presence of non-blanchable erythema. Very good. That is stage one. How about stage two? Okay. Stage two, you would see that there is an involvement, skin loss, involvement primarily on epidermis and dermis. Epidermis and dermis, these are topmost layers of your skin. Stage one, only redness. Stage two, the dermis and epidermis, there is already skin loss. I want you to look at the photo. See, you would observe some blisters. You know what is blisters? When you accidentally put you know, hot water in your hand, after a few days, you will see blister formations with fluid inside. Those are blisters formation that is common during stage two pressure ulcer. It's very easy to remember. The area or the skin involved, epidermis and dermis. How about stage three? Observe stage three. Aside from the dermis and epidermis at this point, the subcutaneous tissue, the fats, the adipose tissues are in already involved. Epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue. Easy to remember. And I want you to look at the photo right now. The photo just below the, the description. See, there are some whitish um, tissues that you can see. Those are actually subcutaneous tissue, the fats. How about stage four? Haram, Mr. Haram. Okay, stage four, this is full thickness. Aside from the involvement of the epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous, you would see also involvement of the muscles. You would even see the bones. You would even see other supporting structures, okay? You can even put some, you know, it, it, uh, the area is hollow that you can actually see the inside structure. And this can be seen in patients who has been on the bed for several days. And our goal as nurses, we want to prevent formation of pressure ulcer. In fact, in some hospitals, if your patients develop a pressure ulcer, that means you are not providing a good nursing care to your patient. Yes, in some hospitals, nurses, if their patients develop pressure ulcer, automatically they consider this nurse as a not caring nurse. Why? It means that the nurse is not checking the back of the patient. It means that the nurse is not turning the patients every two hours to the sides. The, the nurse is negligent. The nurse is neglecting the patient. And our goal as a nurse, as I had mentioned on the other day, promote skin integrity, protect our patient from developing pressure ulcer. Those are the different stages a pressure ulcer. Again, stage one, non-blanchable erythema or redness. Stage two, dermis and epidermis are involved. Stage three, dermis, epidermis, and subcutaneous tissue. Stage four, epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue, and possibly muscles are there, even the bones and other supporting devices. Did you understand the four stages of pressure ulcer? You may say yes or no. Very good. Very good. Okay. So at this point, we're going to proceed. Now, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, one of the important truths of a nurse is to maintain skin integrity. Preferably, we want to prevent pressure ulcer. Okay. So how do you know, okay, how do you know if the patient is at risk for developing a pressure ulcer? The good thing about nursing is that we have assessment tools. Okay, these risk assessment tools, this is very useful for nurses. Why? Because this tool can help us nurses to identify 
whether our patient is at risk for developing pressure ulcer. So by using this scale, we will know if patient number one has a risk for developing pressure ulcer or not. And if you are able to assess the risk for the development of pressure ulcer for your patient, of course, you are able to provide good nursing intervention. You can prevent pressure ulcer to the patient. We call this risk assessment tool as a Braden Risk Assessment Scale. Okay? This was, um, um, this was formulated and developed by Braden. And the purpose of this risk assessment tool is to evaluate a patient's risk of developing a pressure ulcer. So it will help you to know whether patient one, two, three, four are at risk for pressure ulcer or not. And this is very, very helpful, especially if you are assigned in the ward where patients are unconscious, where patients are immobile, or those patients who are paralyzed. Okay, now, by looking at the scale here, you would see that the risk assessment scale has several components. These components are actually helpful okay, for you to know whether the patient is at risk. Like, for example, sensory perception. You know what is sensory perception? The patient senses. The patients can feel, touch, or the sensory are intact. Okay? Moisture is also assessed. Activity, mobility, nutrition of the patient, friction, and shear. Now, how do you do this? For example, for sensory perception, you need to check your patient. You need to assess. Are there any problems with the senses of the patient? Are the patients able to feel? See the choices. Number one, completely limited. Number two, very limited. Number three, slightly limited. Number four, no impairment. Check your patient. Talk to your patient. Assess, are there problems with sensory perception? If there is no, you give four points. Then you proceed with the next component, which is the moisture. You know what, what is moisture? Moist, moist. There is a fluid. Okay, one, the patient is constantly moist or wet. Two, very moist. Three, occasionally moist. Four, no impairment. You just need to choose which one is applicable to your patient. Okay, or you need to check also for activity of your patient. If the patient is bedridden or bed fast, or if the patients are able to walk. And then you give another point. You check also for the mobility of your patient. Is your patient completely immobile? Or your patient doesn't have any problem with mobility? Again, you give another point. You proceed with nutrition. How do you describe the nutrition of your patient? One, very poor. Or four, excellent. Again, give another point to your patient. Then you assess for friction and shear. We discussed already last Monday what is friction. So, friction is, for example, this is, the, this is the back of your patient and this is the bed. If you can see a possible friction and shear, do you think it's a problem? Do you observe that with your patient or not? Okay, there's a question on, what's that? Activity and mobility are the same. They are not the same. They are not the same. Activity. See, bed fast. The patient is in the bed. Although they are related, but they are not the same. For example, activity, if the patient is bedridden, bedridden means the patient is on bed. Okay? You can give one. Okay? Or if mobility, the patient, even if the patient is in the bed, at least the patient's movement, mobility is movement. Movement of the hands, movement of the legs, or if the patient doesn't have any mobility problems at all. Okay, now, with these six components, you just need to add plus, plus, and plus, and add the points of your patient. Okay, and how do you interpret the score? For example, the score is 
20. Now, how do you interpret 20? I want you to look at the other box. The total possible score of this assessment scale is 23. Okay. And an adult who scores below 18, by the way, there are several versions of this scale. Do not be confused. Okay. There are a new version and this is an old version. What is important is you know how to use it and you know exactly what are the components that you're going to assess. Now, in this scaling, because this scale has 28, but there's also a, a Braden Risk Assessment Scale which is composed of 23. Now, if we use the 23 items Braden Risk Assessment Scale, how do you know if your patient is at risk if the score is below 18? Below 18, that is the cutoff score. You need to remember, score is 18 and below, the patient is at risk. And once you have identified that the patient is at risk, you need to implement extra precautions to your patient. How do you do that? The patient score is 15. You have a 15 according to Leo. Below 18, the patient is at risk for pressure ulcer. So what will I do? Because the score is 15, lesser than 18. So part of my nursing intervention, part of my nursing plan is I'm going to position the patient on sideline position every two hours. I will also do back massage perhaps every eight hours. See? That is the purpose of this scale. Okay, any questions before I go to the phases of wound healing? This topic is very important, especially if you are caring for a patient who has a wound, for example, a, a patient who had a malaria. And you can only provide, you know, appropriate nursing intervention to the patient's wound if you know exactly how does a wound recovers and heals. Again, can you type it again? I cannot see the question. Because I'm using cell phone. Ah, okay. Does 18 considered as at least? Yes, 18, but then 18 and below. We, we use it as a marker, 18 and below. So it could be 18, 17, and down. Okay, now, as I mentioned earlier, you will be taking care of a patient who had surgery or maybe a patient who had an accident. And those patients certainly may have surgical wound or any other forms of wound. And one of your nursing responsibility is to ensure that the wound heals normally, that the wound recovers normally. But in order for you to do that, you need to understand how does wound healing takes place. Okay. Now, there are three phases of wound healing. And the first phase is inflammation stage. This is the initial stage once you develop a wound. Just right after you had an injury or you have a wound, the inflammation phase takes place right away. Okay, see, it occurs immediately after an injury and lasts for three to six days. And during this phase of wound healing, hemostasis occur. Hemostasis is very important. Why? Because the process of hemostasis controls the bleeding, okay? Hemostasis is cessation of bleeding within, within the start of the injury up to three or six days, hemostasis should occur. And hemostasis is very important because it helps the wound stop the bleeding. That is the normal compensatory mechanism of our body. Your body will not just let you bleed, through the process of hemostasis, your, your vasoconstriction will occur and the wound will stop bleeding. Okay. Part of this phase also is called the phagocytosis. 
And a phagocytosis, it is a process where macrophages engulf microorganisms and cellular debris. Right after the injury, what will happen is that the patient is at risk for infection because there's a break in the skin. The microorganisms, the infection, are now free to go to the wound. But your body will not allow that. Your body will try to protect the wound against any microorganisms or infection through the process of phagocytosis. This process, you know, normally, um, phagocytosis is part of your white blood cells. It will target harmful microorganisms that will go to the wound and they try to kill these microorganisms. So the patients will not develop infection. After the inflammation stage, the proliferative phase will come in. And this normally occurs from day three to day 21 post-surgery. So at this point, you would notice that your body tries to recover, tries to heal the wound. For example, see, at this stage, you would expect formation of collagen in the wound. What are collagens? Coral collagens, these are materials that are helpful to rebuild the skin that were injured. These are helpful for the regeneration of the new skin. Aside from the formation of collagen, at this point in time also, granulation tissue will occur. Granulation tissue, these are um, newly developed skin tissues. You'd, you would observe that there are new skin tissues growing in the area. Aside from collagen and granulation, at this point, you would also notice dense scar tissue. You know what is a scar? You know, these are dense cells on the top of your wound. We call it a scar. When you have a wound after a few days, you would see a mark. Okay? That mark is actually scar tissue. And that occurs in the second phase of wound healing called proliferative phase. In the last phase of wound healing is very important because it is where, you know, the injured part is being remodeled. It is where the skin is replenished with almost similar skin to what you had just before you had an injury. And we call this phase as a remodeling. It occurs from day 21 and even up to two years. See, at this stage, Collagen formation and synthesis is still continuing. Wood is remodeled. Wood is remodeled, which means, for example, if you had wound maybe several months ago, you would notice that it is, it is almost not there. It is almost not visible. The scar is almost not visible anymore. Why? Because the wound is remodeled, okay? And it continues to reveal, I mean, the collagen. And at this point, you would expect formation of a vascular scar. What do we mean by a vascular scar? A vascular means a scar which doesn't have any blood supply. And at this point in time, you would notice that your epidermis, the, the dermis layers of your skin are almost freshly healed. And sometimes you won't even recognize that once there was a wound on that area. Again, inflammation, the two most common um, processes that occur under inflammation, hemostasis and phagocytosis. Second phase of wound healing, formation of collagen, granulation, and then scar tissue. And lastly, on remodeling, see, there is a vascular scar, the wound is remodeled and contracted. These are the phases of wound healing. Again, any questions with the different phases of wound healing? 
I just wanted you to remember what are the most important thing that occurs in every phases. Because in your exam questions, I might be asking, okay, the patient had a surgical wound. Okay, what assessment would the nurse expect to see in the wound after six months? And you should be able to identify that at six months, the wound might be remodeled and contracted. You would expect formation of a vascular scar and fibroplasts continue to synthesize collagen. Take note of the important milestone in every phases. I will surely ask that in your exam. Any questions with regards to the three phases of wound healing before I proceed? No? Very good, no. Now, we are still in the wound management. Okay, aside from assessing the phases of wound healing, when you have a patient who had a wound, who has a wound and had a surgical wound, part of your assessment is to check for presence of wound exudates. Mr. What are wound exudates? Wound exudates are nothing but fluids or cells that are produced by the wound itself. And these fluid and cells are part of the inflammatory process. That's why I do not know if you remember when you were small, when you were a kid, when you had a wound, after a few minutes or a few hours, you would, exist, you would see some fluid coming out from the wound. Regardless of the color of the fluid, we call them as exudates. Okay? Now, when you assess for the presence of exudates, it is very important for you to remember that there are four possible exudates that you can see on the patient's wound. And why do you need to understand and differentiate this wound exudate? Why? Because each type of exudates, each color of exudates means something. And if you're able to identify the color and the type of exudates, you are able to provide best nursing intervention to the patient. Okay. Going back to the different types of exudates, there are four types of exudates that you need to remember. First, okay, I will go directly with the third one, the sanguinous. What you can see on the third picture, these type of exudates are called sanguinous. You would see that the color is brick red, fresh blood. Okay? And normally, after an injury, you would expect sanguinous exudate, okay? However, sanguinous exudate is not a good indication of a healthy wound. Why? It means that the wound is bleeding. If you see a patient who had surgery three days ago in the hospital, and when you check the wound, you check the bandage, and you see bright red. Mm -hmm. Mr. Leo says, bright red color sanguinous exudate but the patient had surgery three days ago is it normal to see sanguinous exudate after three days of surgery no it means the wound is bleeding and if the wound is bleeding that is a problem because the wound is not healing properly the second type of sanguinous is a combination of a cirrus and a sanguinous. I want you to look at the first photo. We call it a cirrus sanguinous. The color is pinkish, okay? Normally, cirrus sanguinous exudate is very evident a few hours up to a few days after a surgery, okay? Normally, it occurs a day or after a few hours after surgery. And normally, we see this one in a wound that is healing normally. Okay? Zero sanguinous. And after a few days, if the wound is healing normally, the zero sanguinous, the pinkish color, will turn to 
clear exodic. We call it a cirrus. That means the wound is completely healing normally. If you can see white color exudate or serous exudates coming out from the wound. How about the last box, purulent? The color of the exudate could either be greenish, brownish, or yellowish. Is it a normal exudate? No. Once you assess and observe that the wound of your patient is producing purulent exudate, the color is brown. Mister, I assess the wound of the patient and I can observe greenish exudate. We call it a spirulent. That should signal the nurse that there is a problem with the wound. That means that the wound is infected because the color brown, yellow, and green is a combination of white blood cells and pus formation. That means the wound of your patient is infected. And normally, if you observe a purulent exudate from the wound, you would also smell bad smell from the wound. Again, purulent exudate indicates infection. Sanguinous exudate means that the, the, the wound, there is a bleeding. So what are the normal exudates that we expect from a healing wound? Normally, a serous sanguinous, which turn to serous sanguinous. Any questions with wound exudates? Do you think it is clear? Say yes or no. Is it clear, the four types of exudates? Very good. Yusra says it's clear, clear clear very good do you have any questions with regards to the wound exudates you might say yes or no do you have any clarifications or questions with regards to exudates no no okay when you say no that means you're able to understand okay Okay, Suha so has a question. What type of exudate would you expect during the inflammation stage? That's a very good question. During the inflammation stage, you would expect sanguinous type of exudate. However, because of homostasis, the bleeding will stop. After you expect some sanguinous exudate, after after a few hours to few days, it will turn to zero sanguinous pinkish in color. And after a few days from pinkish color, it will appear clear exudate. Again, can you type in again your question? I did not see it, please. Can you type in your question again? I saw last question but was not able to see it. Can you clarify the zeros again? Okay, Cirrus, the color is whitish exudates. It's a normal indicator of wound healing. And normally, Cirrus types of wound exudate is evident after few days once the healing is, um, um, is occurring. How many days we need to check this exudate? Normally, right after the injury, the, the, the exudate should be sanguinous. However, after a few hours, it should turn to zero sanguinous, which means that the bleeding has stopped. And then a day after or after two or three days, the exudate should turn to zeros. But for example, after second day, after third day, after fourth day, and you can still see sanguinous exudate, that means there's a problem with the wound. You need to refer to the doctor, that means it's bleeding. Some more question? Okay. Some more question, no or yes? No more questions before I proceed? No, no, very good. Okay, now we have talked about the normal phases of one healing. We also discussed what are the possible exudates that we can observe from the wound. 
At this point, I'm going to show you and discuss what are the complications of wound healing. Of course, our goal as a nurse is to ensure that the, that the wound is healing normally. However, there are patients where wound healing is problematic because of certain medical condition or certain factors. And this wound might develop to complications. So what are the common wound complications that you would observe in your patients who had a wound? Number one is hemorrhage. We call it as a massive bleeding due to this large clot, slip stitch, or erosion of blood vessels. Hemorrhage is very alarming. Why? Remember when you bleed, when you hemorrhage, a person has only five liters of blood. If you cannot stop hemorrhage, if you cannot stop bleeding of your patient, it might lead to death. It will cause blood loss. Our goal when a patient's bleed or hemorrhage is to stop the bleeding. And you need to report it directly to the doctor. Why? Once the patient's blood loss continues, the patient will die. The second most common complications of wound healing is infection. Okay? It could be caused by contamination of wound surface with microorganism. And this is one of the most common complications that we nurses want to avoid. That's why um, if our patient has a wound, as much as possible, we try to practice a septic technique. What do we mean a septic technique? We wash our hands before we touch the patient. What else? We wear gloves before touching the patient, okay? And we wear our PPE before going to the patient and touching the wound. Why? Because we don't want to cause infection. Okay, you know already that infection can be local or it could be systemic. Maybe the infection is just on the wound itself. But this might lead to systemic infection. The entire body is infected because of a single wound. Because the nurse did not do hand wash. And the nurse just touched the wound without wearing gloves, without doing hand drop. And we want to prevent that. The third one is dehiscence, partial or total rupturing of a sutured wound. What do we mean by sutured wound? I want you to look at the photo number three. The patient had a wound. Normally, if you had surgery or amalia, when the doctor creates a wound, after that, the doctor will suture. We close the wound using suture. Close it. However, there are patients, especially obese patients, especially patients who have infection. What will happen? There would be rupture. It will open. We call it as dehiscence. And the fourth type of complication is the most alarming type. We call it as evisceration. Protrusion of the internal viscera to incision. Alarming. The wound will open and the integral organs will go out. This is very common if you had a patient who had surgery in the abdomen. Once it becomes infected or maybe the patient is obese, the wound will open and if you cannot prevent that, internal organs will come out. We call it as evisceration. Okay. Now, what do you do now if you see some hemorrhage on the, on the wound? Your management is to stop the bleeding. How about infection? If you see that the patient is having infection, you refer to the doctor. And the doctor might give antimicrobial medication to the patient. How about dehiscence and evisceration? Mister, the intestines go out. What will you do? It is an emergency situation. You need to refer it right away to the doctors so that the condition of your patients will be supported. Okay, 
these are alarming conditions. Any questions with regards to the complications of wound healing? Some wounds are not closed, so how can we prevent it? <laughs> okay, now, technically, if a wound is surgical wound or the wound in the hospital created by the doctors, normally it should be sutured or closed. Okay. However, I agree with you, especially if you are in some villages without some hospitals, if the patients had an accident, the wound remains open. The problem with that is this. Infection is very, uh, I mean, microorganisms can easily go inside of the wound. That's why you need to suture it. You need to close it. Okay? Especially if the involved area is large enough. And the problem here, if the, if the wound is open and you, you do not suture it, the scar is very bad. The scar formation is very bad. That's why you need to bring the patient to the hospital. Okay? Any questions? Some more questions? No? Okay. Okay. Okay, we still have time. No, what are the possible nursing diagnoses that you can formulate for your patient? Of course, the most common type of nursing diagnosis if your patient has a wound, if your patient has a pressure ulcer, right after when you see that the skin has a problem, you see a wound, you see a pressure ulcer, one of the most appropriate nursing intervention is, I mean nursing diagnosis is impaired skin integrity related to surgical incision, related to pressure, related to immobility, or related to decreased blood flow. That is the most common nursing diagnosis that you can see if your patient has a wound or pressure ulcer. Number two is infection. Of course, if you see that the exudates are, are brown or greenish, and if you notice that the patient has fever and there are some inflammation and swelling on the surrounding tissue of the wound, your nursing diagnosis, infection. Of course, if your patient has a wound and it is infected, most commonly the patients would have pain. That's another nursing diagnosis. And the fourth nursing diagnosis, this is very, very common among patients who doesn't have any knowledge about the wound. We call it as deficient knowledge. They do not know how to take care of the wound. They do not know the causes of the wound. And if the patient, you know, express to you, Mr. Ma'arap, I do not know what is pressure ulcer. I do not know how to treat it. Aha, uh -huh. your nursing diagnosis is deficient knowledge. And your nursing intervention is what? Health education. Okay, now, if you have impaired skin integrity as your nursing diagnosis, what do you think is your nursing intervention? I'm going to call student. Abdullah. My favorite Abdullah. Okay, Abdullah, can you open your audio? Mm -hmm. Here we are again. Our students are sleeping maybe. Or maybe their brothers and sisters are the one looking at their computers right now. Okay. Salem, are you here? Salem? Yes, teacher. Okay. While caring for a patient who has a pressure ulcer, and you have not, uh, and one of your nursing diagnoses is impaired skin integrity. So what do you think is your nursing intervention? What will you do with your patient? Can you repeat, doctor? Okay, if your patient has a wound, and because of that, your nursing diagnosis is impaired skin integrity. If that is your nursing diagnosis, what do you think is your nursing intervention? Provide the clean, uh, clean one. Okay. One of your, thank you, Salim. One of your nursing interventions is clean the wound. Very good. If the patient has a wound 
and their nursing diagnosis is impaired skin integrity. How do you address your nursing diagnosis? Provide wound dressing or provide wound cleaning. Very good. How about if, if the nursing diagnosis that you have identified is pain? What do you think is your nursing intervention? I will call Iman. Iman? Mm -hmm. So Iman is sleeping. I will call Shaika. Mm. Iman, you don't have microphone? Okay, Shaika, Shaika. Yeah. Okay. Your patient was a surgical wound. You have identified pain as your nursing diagnosis. What do you think is your nursing intervention? Maybe I will uh, give him pain medication to reduce okay, very the risk good. of pain. Very good. If your patient has a surgical wound and you have identified pain as your nursing diagnosis, most probably your nursing intervention is administration of pain medication. One last student, Al Muid. Al Muid. Oh, Al Muid is sleeping? Or maybe Al Muid is in city center now? Okay. How about do we have asthma here? Yes, asthma. Uh huh. How about Buthaina? Yes, Mister. Okay. While caring for your patient, okay, your patient is saying, "I do not know about how to manage the wound that I have. I do not know what's the causes, and because of that." You have identified deficient knowledge as your nursing diagnosis. What do you think is your nursing intervention? Uh, I think teaching the patients about the wound and how can the patient uh, prevent, uh, increase the wound or infection. Very good. If the nursing diagnosis is deficient knowledge, your nursing intervention is giving health education giving health teachings to your patient. Very good. So now you can see the connection between nursing diagnosis and nursing intervention. Okay, now, what's the time? Okay, I will stop in nursing diagnosis. We still have two days next week with regards to skin integrity, okay? Okay, I will stop in nursing diagnosis, inshallah, next week. We still have Monday and we still have Wednesday. We're going to continue our discussion on skin integrity. However, I would like to, okay, I will stop the recording now.